to kick back in. I haven't taken my medication in a long time, and I'm having a hard time. So you're hearing it in my voice. It's yeah. Yes. So it's just getting started. So we'll get used to. And of course, I pick this song, "No Love That Will Not Let Me Go." 402. Hymn number 402. And our singing hopefully will act as a call to Sunday school. What a nice problem. So many people wanted to come to Sunday school and hardly get through the hallway. Hymn number 402. Oh, love that will not let me go. I want to start this one too. I want to love. <laughs> oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe. That in thy ocean depths its flow may richer. Sue and I have had all the same pastors, almost, 
because uh, you had passed a reason as well in that time. Uh, but Sue has, serves also on the direction committee. As I said, she's also on our parish education committee and uh, helps to teach confirmation class here at Ruthford. So without any further ado, I want to pass it over to Sue. Thank you, Sue, for facilitating this. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, that's a really humbling introduction. <laughs> so uh, I also want to say this is a joint effort between the Parish Ed Committee and the Direction Committee. It's a joint effort. And uh, Pastor and I went through and uh, talked about who to ask to be the different leaders. So it's not just me. It's, it's a big effort. Committees and pastor. Uh, so I just want to say that. And I also want to thank Janine Zielinski. She's the one that took on the project of figuring out how to get these mailed out, um, pasting in the inserts that are on the inside for you, and all the, all that it took to get a book like this into the hands of everyone in the congregation who's local, and I know that maybe we're even mailing them out to some others. I, I, I believe anyone who asks, I think, is getting this. So, um, this is a small little book. It's direct. It seems simple, but it's really not. Uh, once you start into it, things just start bubbling up from the Bible. Um, and it's, it's a training manual for us. And all six of the lessons are going to be training in important tools and attitudes that God wants us to bring to our service. Um, so what does it mean to be functioning? I will be a functioning church member. What is the word function? If something's functioning, functioning what's going on? Just, yeah, it's working. It's working. So, uh, all right. Yeah. Uh, you have to be really skilled. I can hardly walk and chew gum. <laughs> so, um, so the introduction uh, of this book. There's a situation between two fellows. Michael and Liam, and who remembers the conversation they had, and what decision has Liam just made that he's telling Michael? Lord. So Liam and his wife are deciding that they don't like the church, and they, there's a bunch of hypocrites in the church, and the pastor doesn't really care about them. Right, exactly, the two big okay. issues. And I'm going to repeat them so it goes into the microphone. He said he felt like there were too many hypocrites he saw too many people not showing the love of Christ the way he thought they should. And then he had some grievances with the pastor. And so for all those reasons, he said, we're, we're not staying. And so by that, Pastor Rayner sets out the framework of why he wrote this book. Uh, anybody remember what it is? How does he respond to the, to what Liam said and did? Okay, so here's his thesis for the whole book. I am suggesting that congregations across America are weak because many of us church members have lost the biblical understanding of what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. So who remembers what model we want to avoid? Met. That we're not consumers. Right. We're not paying for the privilege of being served. Right. Mm -hmm. Is there anything wrong with country clubs? Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> I can't afford that. <laughs> country clubs have their function. You know, their recreation. People belong to country clubs. But is that the model for church membership? No. no. But so many uh, may think it is. And they have a commercial interest in coming. They're, they want it. They want things, uh, and that's, according to Mr. Rayner, not the model. So we want to avoid 
that model, and what is the biblical model? Give me just a couple words. Anybody? Service. Service is the key word. So here's how he phrased it. We, he placed us, he being God, in churches to serve, to care for others, to pray for leaders, to learn, to teach, to give, and in some cases to die for the sake of the gospel. So there are just three little points in this whole chapter. You're, we all are necessary. We are different, but we work together, and everything we say and do is based on a biblical foundation of love. Sounds really easy. Is it easy? No. <laughs> no. It's our challenge. And so why does God challenge us sometimes? Why does life challenge us? Yeah, what was Jesus doing with the disciples those three years? He was teaching them and training them. And were they A students? No. <laughs> no. And they had him in person. So uh, what is what do we have in person that is our training, our big training manual? Bible. The Bible, the Word of God. So we used, to, this is a friend of mine uh, in New Jersey. This was January 9th on Long Beach Island in New Jersey. And the, I, I want to hear from uh, uh, A.J. Dolans. This gave me so much more respect for what he's doing. So these guys are training. So what are they training to do? Save people. Save people. And save their bodies, their life. And what's the metaphor that then goes over to the church? What are we training to save? Souls that are drowning in sin. So this picture works for you as a person, for you. Do we sometimes feel like we're looking at the breakers crashing over us? Yeah, yeah. yeah. As a member of the church, and then, as a church together going out into the world, is the world looking pretty stormy? Yes. Yeah, right. So what's the joy that these guys feel when they've gone out on a mission? What's their joy? Yeah, they, 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 they have saved a life or saved a ship. Uh, and you can go on the internet and uh, Google this. It's really amazing. Those boats do a full roll. They can be rolled over and they pop back up. And that boat looks small, but that's a 47 foot long boat. So that's a big wave. So now we want to talk about another model. How many of you play an instrument? Just a few? No, lots. So somebody who plays an instrument, Isaiah, you play, a be you play beautifully. What does it take for you to be able to get up in front of the church and share your music? Tell us a few things you do to make it happen. Practice. Practice. Do you take lessons? Well, yes. Study. Right. Any, anybody who plays an instrument, You've got to practice. You've got to have uh, the desire to make the beautiful music and the discipline. So this is a special piece of music. Uh, anybody recognize that music? My faith looks up to thee. Some people in this room ought to be recognizing this music. <laughs> My faith looks up to thee. Yeah. Not just the tune. We all we recognize the tune. <coughs> Sue rocks. Have you ever seen music like that? Oh, absolutely. That's Where problem. do you see music like that? <laughs> Come on, Bob, help me out. <laughs> <laughs> That's your copy. <laughs> this is Sue's copy of a bell choir piece, and. At, it amazes me how many Holy Spirit actions have gone on this Wednesday night. And this is what the bell choir looks at when they practice. Have you ever watched the bell choir? Do you marvel? Do 
You want to join? <laughs> Yeah, be a functioning member, join. So how many people in the bell choir? Jason. So there's probably about 10 of us now? 10. So each bell is just one note. Talk about coordination, walking and chewing gum at the same time. Sometimes I just marvel. Some of those folks are dealing with six bells. Well, what's the, the biggest number? Probably eight. Some person could be ringing eight different bells. Don't you marvel at their focus as they're putting them down and picking them up and, and making the music? So what is their mission? And you don't have to put your hand out. Just talk. What's the mission of the bell choir? To, yeah, to play a piece it. that everybody recognizes. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Giving glory to God. Worship. Leading us in worship. What is needed to succeed? How long do you practice? Bob, how often do you practice? Once a week. Usually an hour. And then on a Sunday morning, what time are the cars in the parking lot? Usually we'll begin at 7.30. 7.30. At yeah. Yeah, a lot of practice. And why do they do it? Praise God. Right, right. <laughs> I didn't hear. What was that? Oh. <laughs> well, that works too. I, I mean, God commands us to do things, and we all need a strong leader. But at the same time, there's Christian fellowship amongst the yes. Amen. Right. They're growing in fellowship and love for each other and patience. And prayer for each other when someone's going through a tough time. Right, right. And uh, Marty's going to teach the last lesson, and that's about celebrating the joy of being in this church together. And all through these lessons, um, there'll be things like this that show us the, the joy and why God instituted the church. And what is the impact for God's kingdom? Well, it just draws us to Jesus, the worship, the music, the beautiful, uh, when, when we see the bell choir working together. So the bell choir is a picture of one and two. We're needed, God has a, uh, he wants us to share, but we're individuals and we all are different and we work together. So in the book, in chapter one, what was the other picture that uh, was given by Rainer from 1 Corinthians 12? What's the other model? Well, that's coming. That's parts of the body, right. Thank you. Membership means we are different, but we still work together. So we don't call them ringers, we call them a choir. It's a body working together. You are a necessary member of this body. So do you individually see yourself important to this church family? Maybe you're not very active, but you are important. And so just real quickly, what are some verses you use to remind yourself of your identity in Christ and your purpose. Anybody have a favorite? Matt? Yes, my confirmation verse. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Oh, that's super. Anybody else? <clears throat> Super, super. Even though we didn't have a lot of hands go up, I'm betting each of you has a couple verses that are a great comfort and a driver for, for you as you live. One of the ones I use is, uh, your will be done, Father. You are God, not, not me. So the next question is, 
on what should we be working. I'm not going to show you the next slide. There are lots of missions God has given us in the Bible. What are some of them? Take care of widows and orphans. What else? Elias. The spread fellowship. Excellent. Thank you. Feeding, feeding people, body and soul. Body and soul. Holy communion. Do this in remembrance of me. We're being fed spiritually. We should all pause in our relationship with each other, not a negative one. Right. And that's the main part of this chapter. <laughs> love one another? Yeah, yeah. So let's look. Pick up your cross and follow. Be salt and light. City on a hill. The Great Commission. Go, make, baptize, teach. Let your light shine. Wash feet. Do God's will and bear fruit. I mean, we could go on and on if you did a study. Over and over and over, God is uh, telling us in different ways what he wants of us. So what should our life display to God, to others, here among our fellowship, and then outside to the world? So now people have some Bible verses. So if you have these verses as, as we get to them, if you could share. So who has John 13, 34, and 35? Thanks. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. All men will know that you are my disciple if you love one another. Thanks, Cindy. That's pretty daunting. All men will know we are disciples if we love one another. I fail in that daily. Um, right? We're supposed to show love to the world, and I fail. Uh, who has John fifteen seventeen? <coughs> I do. Can you read nice and loudly? This is my command. Love each other. Very simple, but a challenge. So, <clears throat> I don't know what my note means there. Ah, what t text was in the chapter that he then goes to point number three? And Bob said, love one another. So it was this whole 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> so let's just read through these together. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I am only a resounding gob or a clanging symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I do all that success to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. That's a pretty strong statement. Does uh, anybody have anything to say about that? I, I had a note in my Bible. It, 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 it says... It's heavenly speech versus repulsive noise. Knowledge shouldn't be arrogant. Giving can be condescending and have a commercial purpose. So it has a lot to do with the motive and, and how it's delivered and the loving motive behind everything that we do. So then the next section... Um, love is, I'll, I'll just read this. Love is patient, love is kind. This was what we asked you to memorize. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, not self-seeking, not easily angered, keeps no record of wrongs. It does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. 
When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. So compare the top part, that behavior that, that he's saying we should have, to talking, thinking, reasoning like a child. Are we supposed to grow up? Sometimes. Well, well, what's the thing? Uh, growing old is mandatory. Growing up is optional. <laughs> yeah, this is the optional. And that's what God wants. He wants us to grow up to be mature men and women. So then, uh, let's see. Did we talk about the whole thing? Yeah. Yeah. It's also true that children are self-focused. So as an adult, we should be focused on others. That's a great point. Anybody ever <laughs> believe in the sinfulness of man by looking at a two-year-old? <laughs> right? It's all about them and their needs. And then as we grow, but that's a great point. Thank you, Ruth. Um, so then the end of this, now we see, but a poor reflection, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have fully known. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So there are four progressions, four progressions. Let me get my note. The imperfect to the perfect, the child to the man, poor sight to clear sight, some knowing, full knowing. And then God wants us to try our best to become Christ-like, and that's, that's our goal. So then going back to 1 Corinthians 4 and 5, what did he say about the power of just those nine things that, that we were asked to um, memorize? What did he say could happen if people actually lived that out? Anybody remember? The world would be a better place. The world would be a better place. What about the church? Function better. Right. He actually used the word revolution. Uh, and here's what he said. The principles of these two verses alone are sufficient to cause a revival in most churches. So let's read this section. Okay, let's see. Everybody on page 14. The principles of these two verses alone are sufficient to cause a revival in most churches. We are not to love fellow church members just because they are lovable. We are to love the unlovable as well. Here's the challenge. There's the challenge. It's easy to love those that love us back. It's a challenge to love the unlovable. But did Jesus love the unlovable? Right. We are not to pray for and encourage our pastor just when he is doing the things we like. We are to pray for and encourage him when he is doing what we don't like. That's called intercessory prayer. We are not to serve the church only when others are joining in. We are to serve the church even if we are alone in doing so. Church membership is founded on love, authentic, biblical, unconditional love. That's a tall order, isn't it? Really a tall order. So we believe in Jesus and we confess, and you know the phrase, um, Tell the world about Jesus. If necessary, use words. So, now here's the big problem. This is us. How many... Uh,
just sitting in the service this morning in the first hymn take away the love of sinning breathe oh breathe thy loving spirit into every troubled breast take away the love of sinning right uh, and then in the confession the confession we poor sinners confess under thee we are by nature sinful and unclean so how can we do this we can't. Kevin I think one thing that gets in the way of you know us loving is having a critical spirit and, and I think you know as Christians we should try to give other Christians maybe the benefit of the doubt before we are so judgmental and critical right. I think that's a big thing if we just prayed that God would not give us a critical spirit. Right. That would help a lot. Right, right. Excellent point. So how can we love as Christ loves? What's our answer? Where's our rescue then? Well, we, we, we have to grow up. Right. And when you grow up, you realize that you may not like all the things. You may not like all the songs that Bob Vogel has the choir. <laughs> but you're doing it for the body. Right. Other people do love it. Right. And that's okay. And he had a reason. And that's church. You can't find a church that is just, you know, often Kurt and I the past few years have said to each other, well, you can't, you can't find a church, you know, like, you know, Metal East's favorite church. Right. And so you pray and you ask Jesus to help you see and walk in someone else's shoes. Right. Give people the benefit of the doubt and look at the whole picture, not just your own selfish, um, you know. Great. Your own stuff. Yeah. Thanks. Kevin. I think that's the other aspect, too, that gets in the way is this sense of entitlement that, you know, I've been a church member here for so many years or whatever. I right. want things done my way. I want, you know, and anything that's outside of what's been done for years, sometimes people really are resistant to. Right. They sort of block out God. Maybe God's calling somebody to do something different, but they, they're jumping in line ahead of God. So how can we do it? Who remembers what the song was that the bell choir is going to play on Wednesday night? My faith looks up to thee. Right. My faith looks up to thee. So who has 1 Thessalonians 5.24? Who, who's got that verse? I have that one. <laughs> uh, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Excellent. And I think I have two. One is the message and one is... Oh, okay, from, from the message, the one who called you is completely dependable. If he said it, he'll do it. Right. Do we really trust God? Do we believe that? So often we don't, right? Right, right, right. But when it's not going our way, then... Maybe we don't trust and believe so much. Who has Romans 12 and just the first part of verse 2? Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Right. And who's going to renew our mind? Jesus. The Holy Spirit. So we have lots of promises. So I could have... We could have verses on and on, but let's just uh, read a few of these. So, uh, Pastor was saying law and gospels in Old Testament and New Testament. So here's one from Old Testament. Who's got Ezekiel 36:27? Pat. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us. Right. Thanks. Who has Luke 12, 12? Well, the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time. Did they understand it when Jesus told them? They didn't at the time. Who has Luke 11, 13? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Thanks, Mark. 
who has John 16, 13. Guides on the truth. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. All right. Thank you, Rory. Romans 8, 14. Because those who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. Thank you, Rich. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Don't you know that you yourself are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? Isn't that a great verse for reminding you who you are in Christ? You're an image bearer and you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's a sacred thing. Acts 1.8 Jesus said, But you will receive power from the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Right. The big marching order. So, John 14, 26. Jesus said, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Thanks, Rory. So let's focus on that one verse and go back to these memory, these nine memory things. So, yes, be patient and kind. No, no envy, no boast, no proud, no rude, no self-seeking, no easy angry, and no keeping a record. Is this hard? Yep. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so... Does anybody have any story to report from having memorized this this week? I mean, as soon as I, I really memorized it, a couple of them kept popping up like pop-ups on the Internet. Uh, so, how can the Holy Spirit help us if we have these in, in, in our hearts. Well, two visuals I have. One is there are strings, and there's something going on, and the string is, the string is getting pulled like, uh-oh, are you thinking about this? And another one is like a window shade. You're in the middle of something, and like the window shade comes down in front of you, and it's one of these words. So two days ago, at 7 o'clock, the phone rang, and it was a plumber, first of all, far too early to be calling, secondly, telling me he wasn't coming after I had waited and waited. And after that conversation, I was like, it's not 7.30, and I've also already messed up the whole day. I was rude. I was, I was not, I did not handle that well, and I had to ask God to forgive me. And, and I really worked to be very welcoming when, when I did see him. But the Holy Spirit brought it right up. Okay, you've been rude. So anybody have any sharing to do on this? Does this work for you after you memorize things? Does the Holy Spirit bring it to your mind so you can do better and grow? <laughs> the plumber did call. <laughs> right. Right. It, it's, it's amazing. If you just memorize the nine words, you don't just memorize patient, kind, envy, boast, proud, rude, self-seeking, easy, angry, record or wrong. They pop up right in front of you. You're only asked to really memorize the two words. Patient and kind. And that's, <laughs> one, of things, and that's one of the things that, that I find myself dealing with is in the morning 
spend a lot of time. I love portals of prayer. Yeah. I love it. But just being quiet. And the funny thing is, it's not funny, but it's so important and it's so moving that you, one can walk away from the quiet time. It's not even saying anything. It's the Holy Spirit going through you or going to Jesus from you. Right. Right. And maybe you get a sense of satisfaction. Right. And then when that hits you, I go on the further day and mess it up as well. Right. So right. It's, it's, and that's why we need to memorize it, because right. we, we have to have it right so, there. Right. Then Kurt's saying, we have an advocate. We have an advocate. You can affect somebody from just a little bit of kindness. I got a call from uh, our bank the other uh -huh. day. And you think, oh, what's the bank calling for that? It must be something bad. Well, it was a young lady trying to sell me something from the bank. But I, I know her because of where I do my banking. And her name is Laxie. And she originally came to, from Nepal with her family. Oh. And, uh, but it was a message. And uh, I didn't get the phone. Get the phone. It was a message. And I tried to call back, and nobody answered. So I had to go to the bank. I didn't have to go in, but I went in just to talk to her, and she was telling me how she's just trying to learn how to do this, and she thought that my coming in was so kind to her, yeah. she never thought anybody would do anything like that. Right. I was kind of overwhelmed by the fact that, I thought that was a simple thing, but she, right. she was very effusive in terms of saying, it was really kind of you to come in and talk to me. Right. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Alan. And lots of times, even uh, I remember uh, at Lee's funeral, that David Henney said, Anna, this is Ruthford. Ruthford people turn up. And, and how kind, if, if you're the family of the one who's been lost, and we all go, even if we didn't know the person, or if we turn up at a memorial service when we didn't even know the person. But it's a witness to the rest of the family. Um, there are so many kindnesses like that, that when people are hurting, uh, it really shows them Jesus. <sighs> yes? Kindness, kindness ripples. Yeah. You know, you know, kind of thing and kind of ripples out on the pond. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. So what is the joy of being last? I, I don't think we have time for that one, but that's in this chapter too. He says, I hope when you go through this book, you will achieve knowing what the joy of being last is. So who remembers what the famous verse? What did Jesus say? Right, right, right. Um, so when I think about this whole book, where have you seen some of these words? I believe that Jesus Christ, okay, confirmation kids. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord who has redeemed me, brought me, freed me in order that I might be his own, live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. When are you seeing this lately? Very good, very good. At the Wednesday night services, we're doing the explanation of the second article of the creed. But look at the promise there. The promise. If we serve him, we are in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. So think about being more active, serving. So this is expressing the biblical foundation of church membership right there in the explanation of the creed. And it's a promise. Uh, this is just a, another way to say it from C.S. Lewis. The church is not a human society of people united by their natural affinities, but the body of Christ in which all members, however different, must share the common life complementing and helping one another precisely by their differences. So, 
the, on page 18 of the book, uh, you're asked to consider whether you could sign this pledge. Uh, let's read that. Each lesson has a pledge at the end. I am a church member. I like the metaphor of membership. It's not membership as in a civic organization or a country club. It's the kind of membership given to us in 1 Corinthians 12. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. Because I am a member of the body of Christ, I must be a functioning member, whether I am an eye, an ear, or a hand. As a functioning member, I will give, I will serve, I will minister, I will evangelize, I will study, I will seek to be a blessing to others. I will remember that if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And that's a whole other thing we, we could have talked about um, and should. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice in it. So here I'm saying, let's put clothes on that pledge. You can take the pledge, but what are your actions? Uh, and it, here's another Holy Spirit thing. In the, in the bulletin today, we have the time and talent sheet. That was totally the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, I think it's a great sheet, but I haven't seen Melissa to say great job. And here it is right now with this lesson. And it's out on the hall table if you haven't got one, but you got it in the bulletin. So fill it out and think about whether there are things that you can serve. Palm Sunday weekend, we have the family festival on Sunday. Saturday morning is the shut-in Easter basket preparation. Both of those need volunteers and helpers. Also on uh, Palm Sunday weekend, Pastor Brandt will be here, and we have workshops on prayer, passing on the faith to our children, witnessing, dealing with grief, and walking hand in hand with Jesus, achieving a deeper intimacy with the Lord. And then Vacation Bible School is coming, and we need volunteers there too. So... Wednesday night, as the handbell choir is playing, think of this model of the church. We're all a different bell, and we are all needed to fulfill the mission. And, and that's another Holy Spirit thing. I said to Bob, uh, can, what, can you give me a piece of music? And this is what he gave me. And it's this Wednesday. And it fits exactly with the Holy Spirit helping us to all work together. So we need to train. Another reason I, I wanted to use that, it also shows the power of victory and the joy of victory. I mean, this is life coming at us. But who's driving our boat? Who's driving the boat? Yeah, right. Who owns this team? God. So we have to let him drive, right? We can't be competing for the driver's seat. Um, and the boat is the church, or it's us. But when do they have the joy? Yeah, when the mission is uh, come through, okay. And they can only get there through the training and keeping at it. But they also, Sue, yeah. they also enjoy doing it together. Right. It's a lot more fun right. doing something as a team right. than doing it by yourself. Right, right. And we know humans need community. There's no better community than the church. There are lots of things that people do to find community, but they're missing 
they, they don't understand the depth of joy in, in Jesus and the church. So this is getting to the end. These are things to, th that, that, to think about. That each of you are you're necessary to us all. God wants you to share your gifts. We have a God-given mission, and living out love is the mission. And then I did not make up this. This this is from another book about uh, being a wonderful church, and this is right out of it. Do you believe salvation of the world is your responsibility? No. <laughs> It's either somebody else or the pastor or somebody else. But no, what did Jesus say? He, he gave it to everybody. You have a piece, and I have a piece, and you have a piece. Then, then it all comes together. Right. You can't do it alone. Right. Thanks, Katie. Yeah. Do you want to live showing love to all? Is this your desire? Do you believe the Holy Spirit wants to transform you? Is he dependable? But we have to we have to cooperate and be available. So just in closing, if I could say this prayer and then we're done. And we can have conversation. Um, so let's just pray. Lord, help us to understand your love. Holy Spirit, transform us more and more. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, that's all I have. A little early. Do you have comments and questions? Great job. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I didn't, but... Right, I don't want to be boastful. <laughs>